Welcome to Page One, the award-winning show for writers with the reader in mind. That, that draws the reader along just like fiction. Here's your host and producer, Zita Christian. Hi, everyone. Welcome to page one. I'm Zita Christian. Where do you get your ideas? People who create as a profession are often asked that question. And tonight, my guest has the answers. He is a college professor. He is an author. He is an artist who has exhibited throughout the United States. And he has written a fascinating book on creativity. The book is called Where Does Art Come From? And the subtitle, How to Find Inspiration and Ideas. Let's meet the author, William Clubup. Bill, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I am fascinated by this subject because as a writer myself, I'm, off, I'm often asked the question, you know, where do you get your ideas? And I think that people who are asked um, fall into one of two camps. Either they cringe at the question or they get very excited because they want to talk about where the ideas come from. I'm in that latter category. Where are you? What do you, what do you say when somebody asks you, where do you get your ideas? First of all, I say, do you have about 10 years? I can give you the answer. Yeah. But uh, it's actually, I get very excited about it because that tells me that that person is really interested in where ideas actually do spring from. And there are a multitude of areas where ideas come from, but I find mostly from the inside. Well, you know, speak, speaking of inside, let me just say right up front, one of the things I really, really love about, about your book is that in the very beginning of the book, because I think, I think it shows a, a vulnerability, the author's willingness to, to show a, vulner, a vulnerability, you, you talk about your personal life as a kid. I mean, you, you're telling your own personal story in this very circuitous route that got you to art. And one of the things that you talk about was an experience, multiple experiences, with teachers. So talk to me about support, non-support from teachers, and, and particularly in your story. All right. Um, the first event in my life that was really significant was in second grade. And... We had been given our materials before, but this particular day was around the holidays. And she put down this really deep blue piece of paper in front of each of us and handed us a toothbrush and some white paint. And we were to paint with the toothbrush on the paper. Oh. And the shapes that it made, the fact that I was using a toothbrush itself was pretty unique. And I was just mesmerized by how that white paint reacted on that blue paper. It was just, it was, a, it was a magic moment. And I didn't really process that until much later in my life, that that was a significant part. And then the second event took place when my father bought a paint-by-number kit. And he, was, he would take it out at night and put it on the dining room table, and he would take the little jars of paint and the little brush, and he would fill in the little shapes. But what fascinated me wasn't what he was doing as so much as smell of the paint. The aroma was just mm -hmm. magnetic to me. So I couldn't wait for him to do it when he would take his materials out. And then when he was done with those, those little paintings, it was, it was over. <laughs> until Perfume much, bottles empty. Yeah, until much later in life. And when I was in college, I found that uh, my first oil painting class, I had the same reaction when uh. we, we took out our paint. And it was, I was giddy with the idea of materials being a stimulant, yeah. in a way, um, was, uh, was profound. I would think, too, there was the association, an association of, of a very nice time in your life, with, you know, watching your father and, and doing creative work. Um, tell me about school experience, uh, the, the whole idea of teachers who, in ways that they can support or, or not. Well, I find that I've had both experiences. And in grade school, it was fine. But when I got to junior high school, I had a teacher who uh, was, uh, he had expectations. And it was, 
I felt I was doing very good work in the class, and mm -hmm. I compared it to other students, and I thought I was doing fine. He kept giving me really bad grades. But deep inside of me, I said, there's something more. So I never took another art class until college, but I continued oh. to work on my own because I had the fire, and I just had this knowing that he was wrong in what he was telling me, and that was my intuition guiding me, and I paid attention to it, and Smart. I honored it. Very, very smart. You know, I remember reading something in your book about you're, you're, you're going to college, you're working with the career counselor, and you're figuring out what classes you're going to take. And you're, you're into math and science, and, and your girlfriend says something to you about art, like, oh, you're, you, you're so good at that. You should be an artist. And, and, and talk to me about your reaction to that and, and what happened. Well, when, when I sat down with that counselor, uh, he asked me um, what I wanted to do, and I had no clue. What, what profession I wanted to be. I had no specific goals other than I wanted to go to college and get an education. And when I went home, and that evening I talked to my girlfriend, she said, well, you know, you're really good at art. And it never occurred to me that that would be something that I would take in college. So I went back the next day, and we reworked my curriculum. Uh -huh. And we included some art courses, and that's when it really began. I'm so glad she had that conversation with you. <laughs> I think so many times other people can see things about us that we don't see. We take it for granted or, or discount the fact that it could be so important or so needed in the world, so valuable that it could be a career. Mm -hmm. uh, we, just, we just don't think that well, way. Well, the question you just asked me about um, instructors, uh, I feel like that's a great instructor does that with a student. They, they see a nugget in their work and they build off that nugget and they turn it into a mountain. At this very moment, I'm thinking there are going to be so many of your students, I hope, who will see this show and having probably had that experience with you are going, yes, absolutely, here is the teacher, here is the professor who saw the nugget in my work. So I want to ask you the genesis for this book, where does art come from? So what's the genesis of the well, story? I had the idea uh, for the book probably about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And my daughter was very young at the time and I took a little bit of time and I wrote three pages and that's as far as I got. And then I forgot about it. In the fall of 2012, I was looking on the internet and I got this email from a art store in New York that was offering free seminars online. So I watched one of them. It was about five minutes. And the man who was hosting it, uh, I found very fascinating. And he, he was uh, an art coach. And I felt, this is the time in my life where I need to reach out and maybe do something that isn't just my own uh, footsteps. So I emailed him. We set up a phone conversation. And the first phone conversation we had, he asked me what I wanted to do with my art, and I told him. And then he says, is there anything else that, that you are interested in? I said, well, you know, I started this book. He goes, well, tell me about the book. So I told him about the book, because I already had the title. So he said, I find that that's really interesting. Why don't you take two weeks, and I want you to write the title of each chapter and a synopsis of each chapter, and then what it might say on the back of the book. Oh, that's brilliant. But listen, yeah. but what happened was that that night, I sat down to do it, and I did the whole thing in one night. What? And it hasn't changed since I began writing the book. You wrote the whole book? No, I wrote the, the synopsis and the, the titles of each chapter. Oh, my, I was going to say, my, you, no. you never slept. No. Oh, my gosh. And then from, so I knew that it was, it was going to happen after that. It was just in you. It was already it, in it, there. Yeah, just... Oh, that's really great. I like that. A great story. That's mm -hmm. I like that. Um, one of the things that you had in in your well, I say one of them. At every page I went to, there was something I I my copy is, is filled with highlighting and marks and and all sorts of things here from from my own copy. You had something in there in particular though that I wanted to talk about now, and that's what what I call that that power of language. When someone says, "Can I?" versus how can I? Talk to me about that. Uh, the first one, can I? I always say yes. 
And I used to have a little sign in the classroom years ago that, uh, that was posted on top of the door that says, I can. Because a lot of the things that people would come in with is, I can't do that. I can't do that. And I go, well, why can't you do that? You're just repeating that phrase in your head. Of course you can do it. And we'll do it together. And the how-to is, is a little different story because the how-to is basically the mechanics and how we set up a, a routine for discipline, how we set up a routine for uh, looking at what we've done the previous night, do a lot of um, evaluation, self-evaluation. Like and editing for a writer. Like editing, but also you're learning from the things that you've put down on paper. Yeah. It's like a little map, and every time you put something new down, I want you to write that in your journal. You notice something new because the new things just happen. They just pop up because at that particular moment, you are not thinking, you are just doing. Yeah. I bet you're a popular professor. I can tell that already. Um, you said, also in your book, talking about this personal benchmark, and you said, the combination of seeing a possibility and feeling its accompanying excitement became a benchmark for my entire artistic career. I read that and I thought, yes, this man is an optimist, and I relate to that. Talk to me about, about that. Well, um, ideas. Uh, ideas are precious. Uh, mm -hmm. We should never, ever let go of an idea. I have always kept a notebook next to my bed because ideas usually come at the most inopportune times. Oh, yes. Lights are out. Oh, i got to turn the light on. So I, I got tired of getting up and trying to find a notebook, so I always kept one there. Sometimes I would keep a tape recorder. Uh, now it's my phone. I can, I can actually write yeah. it down the seed of an idea. But the ideas are fleeting, and if you don't get them down, you're not going to act on them. And if you, when you act on them, that's when they become exciting. And when I get a new idea, and I get them all the time, I have to decide which ones I want to do, because there are mm -hmm. so many. And what will happen is I will get this idea, and I will, I will write them down, and then the next day I will look at them, and the ones that are really jumping are the ones that I'm going to what I'm going to do. But the feeling is the same as that same feeling when I was in second grade and I saw that blue paper and that white ink. You know, I'm never going to throw a toothbrush away again. I'm just going to start keeping a little pile of them and um, maybe even just use some white out just to practice with that. You know, that. one thing that I, I find very, uh, uh, that maybe people don't think about is take someone like Vincent van Gogh, all right, fabulous artist, when he was working, I'm sure he was so excited about what he was doing, even though he wasn't popular. Yeah. Because when you're in, in the studio and you're making something and it's brand new and it's just it, it, it's really exciting, yeah. you just want to jump out of your skin. Yes. And you lose track of time. You, you, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I've been there and, and, and I treasure those, those times. That is, that is really, really something. There was something else in your book, and right about that, that place, we were talking about the difference between someone who has an idea and does nothing and someone who has an idea and actually puts the work behind it. And I think you were talking about Steven Spielberg. Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, and I'm paraphrasing this, but I, I read once where he said, uh, everyone gets ideas. The difference between you and me is I act on it and you don't. Yes, yes, uh, yep. <laughs> so um, one of the big topics I wanted to talk with you about, Bill, is realizing the, the value of art, the importance of art. And uh, I think all artists you know, have you know, the universal feelings and then some, some specific feelings because it relates to the kind of art that they do. But why do you think art is important, both to the individual who's creating it and to the person on the on the other end, receiving it in whatever way, but also to society. Uh, three good questions. Um, the, the the first one, uh, art is important to the artist because it reveals things to them, and it helps them grow. Uh, it helps them with issues in their lives. It helps them to visualize things that maybe they can't speak about. But when you see it on paper, yeah. you, you, under, you start to understand the language. Um, for people to, uh, for other people, the viewer, the artists themselves become the viewer after they make the piece. And I often see things in my own work that are revelatory that, oh, I, yeah. I, that I didn't notice. Um, but I let that happen because yeah. I don't like to judge it. 
But the significance of that is that uh, when, when we look at art, it's enriching. And I'm talking about art that is really true and honest and, and not superficial, right? Stuff, something that, that is, goes to your core or relates to your emotions or some impacts you in some way that is intangible in words. And you have these feelings. And I remember the first piece of art that I saw like that was a Cezanne. I used to think it was just a still life, but when I started to look at it and I realized what it was really about, it, was, it just it blew me away. The power of, of what was going on in, the, in his pieces had nothing to do with the fact that they were objects. It was, a, it was a resonating kind of spirituality that was in the work. And do you think that that was just, I don't say just, but was that your own interpretation? Well, obviously, but, but did other people think the same thing? Other people who study art? I don't know. Um, but I do know that I also saw other things in it that I wasn't aware of, like his sense of formal composition was something that I wasn't completely aware of. And when I realized it in his work, it changed the whole way I looked at art. Do you think that there's a difference, an appreciable difference, between looking at a work of art in, say, an art book or looking at something on the computer and going into a gallery or museum and looking at the real thing? Uh, the, 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 looking at art in the flesh is the only way to look at it. I mean, to get stimulated at for looking at it in a book is really great, which I spent a lot of time in the art library. But when I went to uh, New York and I went to uh, went to Paris and, and London and looked at artwork in the flesh, it was just amazing. I remember the first time I saw a David painting in the Louvre, and I had been seeing them on screen, very small. And, uh, the sheer size of just the physical piece of canvas was amazing. Uh, they were huge. I mean, they were like 12 or 14 feet tall and, and stretched wider even still. And the impact of that viscerally is completely different than looking at it on a small scale. So does it, does it fire the, the actual creativity, the creative process in you, uh, other oh. than just an, the appreciation? Oh, yes. But do you think creatively diff in a different way? Uh, yes. Uh, when, when you see, uh, I'll use uh, Gauguin as an example, because Gauguin's paintings to me don't translate very well into books. When you see them in, in person, they have a, a really subtle beauty that it doesn't come across in a book. And they're very, some are very tender, which you don't notice in a book. But then from your, from how you create, does, does that, does it affect how you create something? Do you look at something and go, I'll make this more subtle or, yes. or larger or smaller or, or something like yes, that? Yes, I have a constant dialogue with my work. And by looking at other people's work, I don't particularly steal from it. I do at times. But I, I think that what it gives me is that it gives me their voice and, and their power, and then I can take that into my work. And you develop your own voice. Yes, and you develop, and, I've, and yeah. I have developed my own voice through looking at other people's work. Like people ask me sometimes who my influences are, and and they go, really? <laughs> and I go, yes, because there's there's truth in that work. For Rembrandt, like what? Like Rembrandt. Okay. Right. My work looks nothing like Rembrandt. No. But there's something. There's some things about it that are similar. You know, I noticed too on your website. You have a the the gallery there. You you have many different styles. So was it was it a matter that you set out and said, okay, I'm I'm finished with that, or was it a matter of, oh, I like that, but I want to try something else? How, how it works for me like this: I will work on a body of work, and it'll automatically tell me when it's over. Sometimes it's right in the middle of a piece, Ooh, and I stop. That's good. And I but I know it. I know that it's over, and then I've already shifted into something new because something in the work I'm doing now or something in my head. I talk about this in the book in detail. When, you, um, when I'm working on something, I'm always working on something else in my head oh, at yeah. the same time. Yeah. And I'm usually one body of work ahead of where I am at the moment. You know, I always say with, when it comes to writing, I always talk about the, whatever project I'm working on now, that's what I'm cooking on the stove. But there's something in the crock pot. Yes, always. I love that. Always, yes. always, always. And sometimes yeah. it's two or three bodies of work. Right now I'm working on mentally two different bodies okay. of work. Well, um, in the time we have left, big question I want to ask you. We're talking about the, the value of art to the individual and to society. But by contrast, what do you think the stereotypical perception of art and the artist is? I think it depends on where in the world you are. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think in, in the Western world, uh, artists struggle more than other places because it's not, it's not in the history of America that, that really strong 
backbone of art and art history like it is in Europe or Asia or Japan, you know, uh, where art has been a very important part of the lifestyle. Here, uh, it's different. And I find that educationally, for instance, when I was growing up, uh, art in school, in grade school, was more of playtime. Yeah. Right? And I think that when you give people the tools, even at a young age, they start to respond. Because I've seen kids uh, make amazing pieces of art at a very young age, and not what we would typically call art here, because it's not representational, it's not uh, identifiable. It might be very abstract, but incredibly beautiful, and very raw, and uh, has, has qualities that get eliminated by the time they're done with their education. Yeah, isn't that sad? Yeah, it is sad. Um, you know, because you, you know, you're, you're in the educational world, I know, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the idea of using art to teach multiple subjects. Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, I enlisted an uh, English professor to teach a class with me called Art and Writing. And we had people work on projects that had to deal with both the written word and the visual. And it could be in any format. And we used, uh, it, it could be film, it could be traditional uh, like decorate, decorative arts where, you, where, where the written word is incorporated somehow in the visual. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you take Islamic art from way back when, those pieces were, were done by a number of artists, calligraphers, artists, yes. like, multiple people worked on the same piece. And I tried to approach the science department and uh, I didn't get much response. But I really feel that there's a deep connection between all of it. Oh, for sure, for sure. You know, I, one of the things I wanted to mention, um, your publisher, Allworth Press. I, I was doing a little research, you know, when I when you had agreed to be on the show, and I thought, my gosh, here's a publisher, a publisher that has devoted itself to publishing books about art. Mm -hmm. Good for them. Yeah, I, was, I them. was very lucky. That's really good. <laughs> now, speaking of that, the book cover. Mm -hmm. So your book cover, where does art come from? And there's this beautiful picture of art, you know, on the on the cover is that one of your works? Yes, it is. Excellent. And I, I kind of thought that would be the case, but of course. Did you submit multiple uh, images? Yes, I did. Uh, originally, the publisher wanted to use a piece of art that uh, was uh, was kind of like clip art, and I said no. Yeah, and no. And I submitted uh, three pieces, and they selected one, and I, it, it's all done from there. Well, you know... Um, there's a lot for us to talk about here, and there's one really special thing I wanted to be sure that we include. One of the things that you that you said in the book was, being an artist is a lifestyle, not a job. That's right. So, talk to me about how would a person going how would a a, a person who is not an artist yet go about having an artistic lifestyle? Give well, me some ideas. When I was in college, um, and I was well on my way deep into my uh, art education, I never thought about a job. I was so in love with what I was doing that it didn't occur to me. But I, I, I got an undergraduate degree in education, and I tried uh, getting a job in a, in a high school, and there weren't any available, so I went back to graduate school because I just loved making art. And when I got out, when I was actually in graduate school, I taught uh, two classes, and I was hooked in terms of teaching. I never knew I was going to be a teacher, but they went hand in hand. And I think that as I progressed, that calling it a lifestyle is that I think art, all right? And, and not just the physical process of art, but all the things that, to me, art encompasses. It encompasses everything. It encompasses science. It encompasses history. It encompasses um, uh, Spirituality, you name it, it's in, it's, in, it's in there. And I try to pack my work with some of those things. You know, one of the things you had, you had in your book was talking about the idea of in living an artistic lifestyle to train, train yourself to, for example, watch the clouds, mm -hmm. which I always do. You know, you grow up as a kid, it's like, oh, there's a dragon, there's a tree, there's, you know, whatever. That idea of, I think, watch, watching the weather, studying the clouds, feeling the rain, you know, look at what moves because of the breeze. But you, you learn to see things differently. You also mentioned um, feeling different textures, 
do you know one of my favorite places is Home Depot? And I go in and I look and I go, there's something rough, there's something smooth, there's something braided, there's something carved. I mean, there's just so much, you know, it, it's not always in, you know, a, um, the fancy boutique, which I also like to go, oh, no, go in, there too. In, in fact, um, uh, when I teach sculpture, I have people actually make a piece with things just from Home Depot. Oh, cool. Very nice. Yeah. Well, you, you also talked about, about trying new foods. And one of the things you talked about also was making lists. And I must tell you, dear friend of mine, Carol Chaput, who is a fine artist by profession, she told me, she's, she's got me trained, that um, I make lists of at least 10 things that I just observe every day. Just simple observations, not whole sentences, just, mm -hmm. just observe. And at first I thought, oh, that's, what's, what's that going to do? But it does a lot. You, you, the eye trains, you, then, and then the brain trains to do, process things differently, see it differently. If you, if you think of, um, there's so many different genres of art these days. And let's say you know, someone is really fascinated by sitting in a coffee shop and looking at what's on the table in the coffee shop. And they start to draw. And then that might turn into a photograph, that might turn into a painting. Yeah. Because they're looking at the contrast, the color, the reflections, the shapes, you know, the negative shapes. They're looking at all these different things. And it doesn't have to be restricted to painting. It can be, restrict it can be vastly um, open to different kinds of materials. Um, you, can, you can make art out of anything. You know, speaking of materials, that, that's something that I wanted to ask you about, too. Um, because you have something in, in your book that talks about when you have to make selections, it's part of it. I liken it to in writing, learning your craft. And, and it's a matter of, well, what tools are you going to use? So talk to us a little bit about that, that whole idea of the quality that you, that you have to consider when you're making art. Quality is a big thing. And when I say quality, I mean, you, you can tell from looking at a piece of art that they've invested something into it that's serious, right? And they love what they do, even though you might not understand it and yeah. it might be really foreign to you, you can appreciate how it's made just on that level. Um, and it can be, I, when I saw a piece of, uh, of sculpture once that was uh, so enormous that it was just a plate of steel that was curved and there were two of them close to each other and they were so threatening right the just the mass of, of the form and the way that they were just balanced on their edges but the patina the surface was this rusty steel so it actually was beautiful at the same time yeah. so it was beautiful and threatening at the same time so when, when we when we think about materials our choices are vast and that's why i say make lists because you might be attracted to things that are really smooth yeah and some of you might be attracted to things that are incredibly rough you know, this um, this is just going to have to lead to another show. I have a couple other artists on, and I'd love to, for you to come back, and we'll talk more about this in sort of a group setting. But in the meantime, Bill, thank you very, very much for being on the show and the book, Where Does Art Come From? Because now you all know the answers. So I, I want to explore this more in detail. And so I also want to thank my Page One crew. I want to thank you and the viewing audience. I love to close this show with the words of the fantasy writer, Ursula Le Guin, who said, there have been civilizations that did not use the wheel, but there have been no civilizations that did not tell stories. So find your story and find a way to tell it, perhaps in a painting, and do join us again next time. Thank you. Food for the crew and guests is provided by Manchester Grill of Manchester, Connecticut and Angelo's Restaurant of Glastonbury, Connecticut. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email Zeta at ZetaTV.com or write to Zeta Christian, Page 1 TV, PO Box 1515, Manchester, Connecticut, 06045 dash one five one five you can watch this and other episodes of page one on youtube.com slash zeta 3x3